Uh, our next top talk is an uh, unusual one, shall I say, <laughs> a very interesting one. Uh, Chris is going to talk about basically creating interactive fiction. Uh, I know you will enjoy it as much as I enjoy hearing him talk, so give him a warm welcome. Thank you. Now, this is going to look a bit weird, and there's reasons for it, which are probably fairly obvious, but uh, I've also changed the title, but it's basically the same thing. Maybe some of you out there have stories you want to create, but you're programmers. There are ways to combine the two, and this is what I'm going to talk about. So, let's begin. So, first, you have to make a decision. Do you want to know more about me, or do you want to go into history? That's probably the right answer. About me would not take very long. So, <laughs> so history. In order to understand a little bit of what interactive fiction is now, let's have a look at what it was in the past. And it's kind of more influential than you might think and actually um, inspires a lot of modern things. And some of the older people in the audience might recognize some of these, might have played some of these. It sort of depends where we are on the timeline. So, the first one, let's have a look at books. Some of these may be familiar. Why am I starting with books when this is a programming talk? Well, you have to start somewhere. And this is kind of where the world gets introduced to this concept, this concept of interactive fiction where you have a story and you play a part in it to, to form the story. Obviously, this is a little bit contrived. The story is not infinite. It's not like a modern computer game. There's certain paths you'll be forced to follow, but you get the rough idea. So the classics that kind of kick-started this modern genre, I'm sure there are historical examples that go back even older, go back even longer, but are the Choose Your Own Adventure books, to the point where Choose Your Own Adventure is almost like Googling with, for search. It's actually a brand name, but um, it's also kind of a concept, what people think of. And there was a lot of these books. They ran for nearly 20 years by a variety of different authors, but first started by this uh, writer here, Edward Packard, um, and they were mostly aimed at children. These ones were fairly easy, this kind of aspect of do you talk to the goblin or do you fight the goblin? Go to page two, go to page three, etc., etc. Um, you may remember these. Um, they were mostly aimed at children, mostly fairly straightforward. Not much of a game, really. More of a, a choose your path. Then, coming on a bit, is Fighting Fantasy. Another long reign of novels, mostly by these two people, Steve Jackson and Ian Livingston who are English authors who have both gone on to do many other things, actually. Um, Ian Livingston founded a games workshop. If any of you have ever been into like Warhammer or Warhammer 40,000, he's one of the creators of it, but started here with these fighting fantasy books. Um, and Steve Jackson also has done other things, but it's very confusing because there's an American Steve Jackson who also makes games, and they're not the same person. But anyway, <laughs> that's a, that's a, I digress. Um, again, lots of these. They tended to be aimed more at uh, older children, teenagers. Um, you can probably still have a lot of fun with them even as an adult. Um, a little bit more combat oriented, kind of thinking like dungeon crawls, that sort of thing. Um, sometimes had some very loose mechanics, but still very much, what do you want to do? A, B, C, flip to a page, off you go. Next, Lone Wolf. This is actually one of my favorite ones. Another English author, actually. I don't know if there's a <laughs> strange, uh, strange pattern there. Lone Wolf, uh, about 10 years long. Uh, these were much deeper books. Actually, the reason I really liked them is the other two, each book was separate. Each book did not have any bearing on a previous book. Whereas with Lone Wolf, it was actually each book built. So you would do book two after book one, and you would kind of, your character would become stronger and better throughout the series, and it had like even a basic character sheet, a magic system. So if you were kind of into more Dungeons and Dragons or something like that, this was like a weird stepping stone to that. But still fundamentally books, you flicked backwards and forwards between, and actually had an entire world around it. I think it was Mag Magdamund, Magmund, or something like that, 
with like you could buy books with maps for the place and all sorts of things. I think there was even a point where the book series split off and you had Lone Wolf and then you had like a, a wizard one as well and you could actually kind of, you could almost branch off the books you read based on the character you wanted to play. So much, much deeper. That said, all of these have made a comeback in recent years actually. <laughs> especially uh, Fighting Fantasy and Lone Wolf. Lone Wolf has now, I think, just actually relaunched the entire series of books with new covers, uh, also available as apps or iPad apps and things like that, um, and in computer games as well, which we'll come to in a minute. Um, and same with uh, Fighting Fantasy. In fact, I think there's a book out now of 25 years, 30 years, whatever it is, of, of Fighting Fantasy. Um, so these have made a comeback. They seem very old-fashioned now, but they've actually been reinvented for a modern audience, probably because all of us who played them as children are now adults with money, and we like to spend money on retro things, but still. <laughs> so they might seem dated, but they've actually made a comeback. Computer games. The interesting thing with interactive fiction computer games is you could think of them also as text-based adventure games. In fact, some people might argue they're not quite interactive fiction, but they kind of are in the modern context of what a modern computer game would be called in, in the same way. Um, and generally with these, they're a little bit different. You, you didn't click links, although you, you maybe could in later versions. You generally typed. It would say, like, the classic one is, you know, you wake up in a dark room. What do you do? And then you would sit there for ages typing, look around, command not recognized. Okay. Stand up, don't understand, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. They were very frustrating games, but at the time, they were groundbreaking. And uh, adventure is actually bizarrely responsible for... I was reading a book on the origins of ARPANET, which then becomes the internet. And uh, adventure was basically the first computer game and was so popular, it kind of invents time sharing and network computers so people could play computer games. So computer games, this computer game is basically responsible for a lot of the modern infrastructure we have because people wanted to play this kind of dumb game. <laughs> uh, so they, they, had a, they had their time. Infocom is a company that was a classic company that made lots of these. Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy based on the book was another one that was quite famous, but there's a lot of them. Coming, uh, oh, here's a screenshot actually, there we go. Out of interest for the programmers here, Zork was written in its own programming language. This is what people did in those days, they still do, called ZIL, Zork Implementation Language. Of course, why not? Uh, most of the others used in form, which I will come back to later. It's actually still going. Uh, Tad's Adrift, kind of still going. It, the last uh, release I found was about 10 years ago, so you could probably still get it working. Um, and then there's other similar games. Some of these might seem more familiar to you because they're a little bit newer. Games like Monkey Island and Day of the Tentacle. Monkey Island from LucasArts. LucasArts made quite a lot of games. I don't think they exist as a company anymore. I'm not sure. Well, not in this, this way. This is a bit different. You had graphics. The graphics were pretty basic, um, even for the time. But you had options. Now we start to get to this kind of more... Uh, useful way of interacting instead of typing something in and people in it trying to understand you. You pick from a variety of options. You have items you can use, this kind of thing. All of these games are very, usually very uh, funny, in quote marks. <laughs> Monkey Island is still fairly infamous for some of its humor. Some of them were more adult as well. Um, but this is kind of the, the, the uh, evolution of those older games into something more modern. And then other media, video, yes, interactive video, <laughs> atmosphere. Uh, this was actually made by an Australian company. It was popular in the UK, I think a few other countries. I found, it, I found translated versions of it when I was looking for this image. This actually had a video, a VHS, if anyone remembers those. They were like DVDs, if anyone remembers those, except you had to rewind and fast forward back between things. Yes, you had an interactive game, where you had to rewind and fast forward. But at the time, it was amazing. <laughs> Actually, it wasn't that popular, to be honest with you. But, but, and then the, the guy on the screen, who kind of looked like the Emperor from Star Wars, would shout at you and tell you to do things and call you an idiot. And you would try and get these keys 
And I think I played it once, to be honest with you. But, uh, and actually, latterly, if anyone remembers Video CD, which was a somewhat um, uh, a format that kind of died very quickly, you had interactive actual movies like this. Uh, and this may sound familiar, because there is an interactive movie from much more recently. But this was um, on Video CD, um, which didn't last very long either. But anyway. <laughs> OK. So that's the past. It helps to understand a little bit of what came before, and it's always nice to, to reminisce. Let's jump to the present. So interactive fiction is actually quite popular at the moment. It's probably as popular as it's ever been, but they tend to be, it tends to be kind of lurking in, in corners of the internet and things like that, as many niche ideas do. So you have to look kind of carefully to find it, uh, you know, if you look carefully, the things come. So I'm going to start, I'm not going to give you a choice this time because I want to kind of follow a particular narrative here. Let's have a look at some examples first. So Telltale Games is a company you might have heard of. They do a lot of uh, tie-ins. They shut down a few years ago, but they have been taken over and are kind of still releasing games as far as I could tell but they released a lot of um, tie-ins with The Walking Dead, Batman, a whole bunch of uh, movies and TV shows and other intellectual properties. Um, for some strange reason, the only one I could find that showed the menu was in German. I don't know why, but, <laughs> but I think you get the idea. Uh, they're kind of, they, they're usually apps. These, I don't know why I'm doing a book symbol for an app, but there we go. There we go. Um, so iPad, for example, other tablets works very well in that format. You have kind of nice graphics. The graphics do something, but they're kind of more like a, like a cartoon. You have options. You follow it through. They have a lot of things like state and variables and logic trees and things like that. Um, and they're, they're easy sort of games. They're not particularly complicated games to play. You don't have to really learn a system or anything like that. You can follow a story. It's a nice casual game. And Telltale Games did very well. I still don't entirely understand why they shut down. I'm not sure. Um, commercial tie-ins is a fraught business. But they made a lot of these in this period of time, all fairly similar. Another one is 80 Days. You may know this, but I include it for a reason. Um, they're still going. I don't know why I put 2019. They're still going. Um, so. This, I bring this up for a different reason, for two reasons. So it's somewhat similar. You have some images, you have options down here, you have settings, there's a timeline, you even have uh, like in-game um, score or currency, so variables in the game. But I bring this up for two different reasons. Firstly, because even though this is interactive fiction, these games are made in professional gaming tools like Unity and Unreal, um, and there's uh, specifically, I'm going to show you a demo of Inky in a minute. And this is the tool that the company, who are called Ink Studios, um, actually built to create the narrative for the game. And I will show you sort of how that works in a minute. It's one of the reasons I include them, because they actually make one of the tools that a lot of people use. Depression Quest. This is a classic one built with a tool called Twine. Twine is probably, if you've ever looked at this form of interactive fiction, um, and if you hadn't guessed already, this presentation is in Twine, this kind of lots of text, click here, click here, things coming and going. Depression Quest is kind of uh, what personifies this genre. They tend to be very story heavy. They tend to be created by people who are not really programmers, but want to have a degree of interactivity. Um, and they tend to, they tend, the, the narrative and the story tends to go to places that you only find in independent gaming. Um, so this one, as you might guess from the name, deals with depression. You don't tend to find AAA titles that sell hundreds of millions of copies about those sorts of topics. And this is kind of the world of independent gaming. Uh, and they all run as web pages, basically, it's HTML. So very easy to distribute, and there's certain sites that find these a lot. Um, the creator of this game is famous for other reasons, which I don't really want to go into, but the name Zoe Quinn might resonate with some of you. Uh, and the, actually, the, 
what dragged her into a rather horrible experience is kind of to do with this game. So it's weird. It's not a particularly like well-known game, but it, it, lots of things happen because of it, which is weird. AI Dungeon. This one is more recent. This is like the old school games that we saw earlier, but built with GPT-3. So it's, it's almost, you, you kind of have a degree of uh, templating in it, and then the AI basically responds to you and makes stuff up. And I played early versions of it, and it gets weird very quickly, as you might expect. Uh, GPT-3 is probably better now, but um, it can get very odd and quite surreal and quite disturbing at times, actually. Bandersnatch. Um, this is not really a game, but as I referred to earlier, it's an interactive film. Um, it was actually the original storyline for it was created in Twine. Obviously, the, the film wasn't made in Twine, but um, I think a lot of people probably played it because it was on Netflix. It was mixed, mixed success, I think, but um, it's one that a lot, a lot, probably a lot of people have tried. Codename Cygnus is one of, it's one of, it's not the only one, voice-based interactive fiction. Interactive fiction with Alexa and Google and all these devices. It actually works quite well because you have an actor reading narrative to you and then you say what you want to do and the narrative changes, etc., etc. It can get a little tedious sometimes with this thing shouting instructions at you, but it's quite interesting. And this is, this is a, a sort of smaller studio that makes this one, but... Um, Quite a, quite a cool kind of idea of a twist on the genre. So, that's some recent examples. In the time I have left, I'm going to show you some of the tools behind some of these. That's probably what you're interested in most. These come and go. So I'm going to focus on the ones that are most active, because I found some that just did not work anymore. Tuesday is very much, as you can probably somewhat tell, maybe, probably can't actually, kind of aimed more at like the manga anime market. <laughs> you can probably see that from here, but if you look very close, you'll also see a lot of the text is in Japanese somewhere. Can't really see, I can't even see it now, but it is somewhere. I tried it recently. It's a bit odd, but it works um, and is quite nice and visual. Um, it's free, so if you, if you wanna try it, try it. Okay, now we get into the kind of bigger ones. So this, I include I don't know how to pronounce it. Artisi, Artiki, I'm not sure. Draft is, <laughs> I'm gonna actually show you a real screenshot in a second. This is not really a game making tool per se, except it is. It's actually what narrative designers will probably use in a lot of uh, big studio games. So I think the biggest game they cite as a customer is um, uh, Elysium, Something Elysium. Elysium, I've forgotten the name of it. Quite popular role-play game. Something Elysium. I can't remember. <laughs> it's a fairly well-known game. Um, and this was used for it. I'm going to show it to you very quickly. It runs only on Windows, so I actually have to launch an emulator here. Yeah, it's an incredibly complicated application. I started playing with it last week, and I barely scratched the surface. This is an example. They've replicated uh, Dracula, the story, in here. And it's really aimed at big studios with big teams who create the narrative and someone might be responsible for creating the character profiles, someone might be responsible for creating the, the, what they say, someone might be responsible for creating the maps, all sorts of things. You can do all of it here and it's really aimed at a team of people, not just a sort of independent developer. There's a free version, actually, you can do quite a lot in the free version for independent developers, but the interface is completely overwhelming. I must admit, I thought this would be cool for prototyping some of my ideas, but I got completely lost with the interface, and it's extremely hard to see. This is probably the clearest it's ever been. When I was looking at it on my computer, I can't even read half of it. It's, there's a lot going on. But, huh? Disco Elysium, that's it, yes. <laughs> Um, so this is a tool that's used often by the people creating the narratives, not necessarily creating a game at the end of it. But it's, it's interesting to throw it in there because then we get into the world of um, taking a narrative and putting it into Unity or Unreal, like a professional game engine. Um, and this is kind of where these tools sit. Okay. 
Inc. I mentioned um, 80 Days, created by Inc. Studios. Inc. is their uh, tool. Um, it works a little differently. I'm going to show you an example here. I don't know if that's, that's fairly visible. Um, it's an Electron application. A lot of them are because it's HTML technologies. This is a, a demo project they have. Um, it works a little differently from something like Twine, where generally you click and you are taken somewhere else. In this, it, it's odd. Like, it took me a while to understand it. Um, every time you click, it kind of adds to the story. So you keep seeing what's there before, and it keeps going, which, which is a bit odd to understand sometimes, because the way that you change the text is it takes a little bit of time to understand. As you can see over here, a lot of these are kind of markup style languages, not really markdown, but kind of sometimes. Um, and you have ways of defining the flow, the options, the logic, et cetera, et cetera. Variables, you can see things like, this is sort of an if statement, uh, and you can see variables here. So the, the main programming in these sorts of games is, is logic trees, to be honest with you, and variables, because that's kind of how they work. You'll see if I scroll down a bit, uh, it's not the best one to look at, but you'll see it works on indentation. <laughs> and sometimes if you have a really complex narrative, the indentation can kind of get ridiculous uh, and kind of hard to tell what you're doing. Um, but it's, you know, everyone has an opinion and that's just how they do it. Uh, what is interesting with them is they do have a plugin for Unity. This is not the same project, but um, here. So they actually have a plugin for Unity where you can take the script, this file right down the bottom that says ink, and they have a plugin that will then render it in a way. Obviously, no one is really going to play a Unity game that's all just clicking on buttons, but the, yeah, it's, it's a very basic example. But the idea is you use the API to trigger something else in the game. So you can make far more visual games, but use the script. So you can have someone who wants to think as a storyteller and then take what they've written, and through using this plugin and Unity, you can build a proper game on top of that script. That's kind of the, the intention. I haven't really tried it with a proper project yet, but they make all their games this way. And I hang out in their Discord, and the, the Unity plugin bit is probably one of the busiest parts. So I guess a lot of people use it, if that's a measure of anything. Inform is the one I mentioned um, earlier that has actually been around for a long time. This version was created in 2006, but it actually is based on uh, work far older than that. It's actually, it took me a little while to figure it out because it's one of these tools that's been around so long, the creators just kind of assume you know what to do with it. And I opened it up and I didn't really understand what I was supposed to do with it. Um, it's now free and open source. It's again another weird sort of interface. Because I was looking at this, and I looked at the text here, and I couldn't really understand what was going on. Because what it's actually doing is it's creating games that are like the old style. It's not clicking links. You actually have to type answers. So it comes bundled with a whole bunch of kind of language understanding that is then triggered uh, to do what you want. And I must admit, this is the demo project, and I struggled to get anywhere. but. Um, so talk to captain. This is not a verb I recognize. There we go. This is like playing games in the 70s again. So <laughs> shout. Don't understand that sentence. Anyway, you get the idea. This is just an example. But if you wanted to play around a bit more with kind of natural language-esque games, this is one idea. You probably want to look at something like AI Dungeon more, to be honest with you. That's probably more modern. But if, if you want to try something like old style games, then this exists. It's free. It's open source. It's cross-platform. I can't quite understand it right now, but um, it exists. And then the big one is Twine. So Twine is kind of what a lot of people think of when it comes to inter interactive fiction these days. It's, it's a weird mix of visual tool, HTML, and JavaScript, and CSS, and things like that. So let's dive in. It's again, it's Electron based, it also runs on the web page. It actually uses a couple of different uh, markup formats. Uh, there's a lot of text here, which is bad of me. Harlow is the default one, which we'll have a look at now, actually, because 
I've got to the end of the presentation, and there's no links. Oh my god, what am I going to do? Let's, uh, let's edit the, uh, the presentation. So here's Twine. You have kind of the branching here. This is the actual presentation I'm doing right now. It's not very complicated, this one. I've done a few things. So you'll see things like um, you can uh, basically everything is kind of called a macro when it comes to programming. You have brackets with something, and then the square brackets where something happens. So this is styling text with the shutter, and then I make a link. Double brackets always means a link. And then by default, if you use that and the, the paragraph doesn't exist, it creates it for you. But you can also override it with um, like a, a right arrow, a straight line and an angle bracket, and you can uh, not always just auto create whatever the name of that paragraph is. And you can see here that it links to this, for example. I did a little bit more complicated, uh, not that one. I did something a little bit more complicated in these. Uh, if you notice that I have three links here, but when we went through the history, we only ever saw one because I said um, only show the links that we haven't been to yet. And it's an, it's an if statement. It's not a particularly complicated if statement, so you can kind of see um, the way you can start to build a, a fiction based on what people do. But I have no variables or anything in this. Uh, other games do. You can see, I hate this, I actually really dislike this. To put an image in, you have to put HTML in, which is kind of annoying. Um, it, it sort of messes up the way things look a little bit, but it's fine. I think most people understand HTML enough to put an image in. Um, you can also see here where I clicked links and then the things showed. I had this link reveal. Uh, to be honest with you, there's a lot you can do. Let me very, very quickly show you the documentation just for the Harlow markup engine. <laughs> yeah, anyway, you get the idea. <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of options. You can actually get quite complicated. And even then, you can extend it with JavaScript as well if you really want to. So. Let's finish the presentation. Um, okay, I've put some comments here to remind me what to do. It also even has um, autocomplete, so you can see here I want to link to publishing. It creates the link for me, and now we'll see that there's a link there. Let's um, add another link in. But why? It's an important link to have. <laughs> And then let's do final one. There we go. Thank you. OK. So let's go back to the presentation. <laughs> OK, now we have a new link. So you've created this wondrous work of interactive fiction. Now what? Uh, IFDB.org is one of the main places, the interactive fiction database. It really does look like a website from the early 2000s, but um, it's very popular. <laughs> they organize events and all sorts of things as well. The more modern kind of, oops, what's in there? The more modern kind of version of this is Itch. You might have come across Itch before. It's a very popular site for independent game developers of all shapes and sizes, including interactive fiction. Most of the games I have mentioned that are not big titles will be available on itch, including a lot of um, things built with Twine, built with Ink, built with all of these. And of course, it's mostly just HTML, so you can also just put it on your own website, <laughs> your own distribution platform. There we go. But why? And I put a bit of shudder in just to, <laughs> just to, just to add something. And look at that. It came in. Ooh, animation. Um, I like it because sometimes I come up with a cool idea. I don't have the time to write a novel. I have written a novel, and it takes a long time, trust me. But sometimes you think, hey, a vampire that likes to go to karaoke. Hmm. Hey, I'll just make a crazy idea with it and put it up on the internet. Why not? It also gives you the option to explore a creative idea um, without really knowing where you want to go. It's a non-linear story. It doesn't have to end up at the same end. It can end up in three different ends, and you can use that to explore it. This is why a lot of the uh, games that are made are these ones that deal with things like depression or creativity or stuff, because 
that's actually a quite a personal thing. So you can create a game that people can, ex sorry, you can create a story that people can explore in their own way, which is quite fascinating when you think about it. And then, yeah, to learn or for fun. <laughs> or if you're not really a programmer, whatever that means, it's a kind of nice gateway as well, because it's a bit like programming, but it's not particularly complicated programming, but it introduces you to some concepts and things like that. So it's another reason as well. And that's me. Um, also on Mastodon these days. <laughs> so, thank you very much. And you can find some of my own works on my website as well, and more to come soon. So, thank you very much.